Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'd like to talk about two kinds of contradictions, which I'm going to call formal and substantial. By formal contradictions, what I mean are contradictions that are contradictions in all possible worlds. They are contradictions by virtue of their form. So, for example, this is the classic P and not P in formal logic. You know, something like, the school bus is entirely yellow, the school bus is not entirely yellow. Um, so, you know, it's very straightforward, it, it's very, uh, you know, clearly a contradiction no matter what, no matter what else is true, these things do contradict them, you know, each other. It's a lot more commonly found, by the way, um, rather than P and not P, in formal logic like P, Q, and Q implies not P. So that that's a lot more common where there are two things that contradict each other, um, but they're not the same thing where one sort of just implies that the other is false. So, uh, for example, in that example, P, Q, Q implies not P. Suppose that Q was religion is responsible for most war, um, all war, whatever, you, you'll find different versions of that. And then Q is that there is no such thing as free will. Well, the thing is, Q also implies not P, because if there is no such thing as free will, then religion can't have caused war, because to, to have caused war it would have to influence people's choices in order to produce war, but since they don't have any choices, if there's no such thing as free will, they're just acting mechanically based upon what the initial conditions of the universe were, there could be no war. It could not be a cause of war. This is inherent. There's no possible world in which it could be a cause of war and there could not be free will. Or there could be no free will, rather. So um, that's an example of how you tend to see these sorts of contradictions more often. They're, they're two things that don't look immediately like they contradict, but they do inherently. Uh, as a side note, um, technically uh, contradictions of definitions are also formal contradictions, as I'm calling them. So like, water isn't wet is a, a formal contradiction. Um, the thing about contradictions of definition, like where somebody uses something, you know, where something is false by definition, um, is that very, of, uh, very often it's a private definition that they're using rather than using the more normal definition and, you know, being contradictory. So in that case, if you see somebody saying something which is self-contradictory by definition, more likely they simply are using the words atypically, unusually. And so rather than it, it being... You know, I mean, it's nonsense in one sense, but they have some actually, most likely, uh, non-contradictory meaning, and they're just not conveying it intelligibly. So really, to understand them, you need to seek clarification. So that's just a, a side note there. The other sort of contradiction is what I'm calling, for the moment, substantial contradictions. Contradictions of substance. Um, that is, they're not contradictions in all possible worlds, only in our world. Um, so to give an example, suppose someone says that the school bus is yellow, but that it does not reflect any electromagnetic radi radiation between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers in wavelength. Well, this is a problem because um, 390 nanometers is very deep violet getting towards UV. By the time you hit 380 nanometers, you're into the UV spectrum. 700 nanometers is a very deep red. Um, beyond 750, you're into the infrared. And yellow light is around 580 nanometers in wavelength. So if they've eliminated basically the entire visible spectrum, yet claim that it's yellow, this is not possible in our world. This is a contradiction in our world. It's not a contradiction of form, but it is a contradiction in our world. Now, um, so substantial contradictions will always depend upon the particulars, um, but you can break this down further by what sort of particulars they are. And I'm gonna call this for the moment the familiar and the unfamiliar. So a familiar contradiction is a material contradiction about something that's actually in our experience. Um, now, my favorite example of this is determinism versus our experience of free will. Because there are people who believe you know, in determinism, that is that we don't have any sort of free will. But we experience it. Um, I would say we all experience it. Clearly, the vast majority of humanity has experienced free will. I'm willing to believe um, that some of the, the people, mostly atheists, who say that there's no such thing as free will, I'm willing to believe that those people are the, the mindless automatons that they claim to be. Um, 
they kind of act like it in, in my experience. So, I mean, I'm not claiming necessarily that literally every human being has had free will, just almost all of us. Um, but in any event, or, you know, that we've experienced it, being technical. Anyway, the resolution that people give to why is it that there is no free will, but we experience there being free will as one of the most direct things we experience, is typically something along the lines of um, our belief in free will is a post hoc rationalization for uh, our warring instincts having come to, you know, one of our warring instincts having come to some sort of victory. Um, I, I say usually, there are a bunch of different ways that, that the um, con conflict between these things are resolved, resolved, but um, in any event, that's the most common one that I've seen. Um, now, of course, the thing is, this is placing that explanation for the apparent contradiction firmly within our experience, because we have all experienced warring instincts. I am really tired, but I am also hungry. Am I more hungry than I am tired, or am I more tired than I am hungry? And, you know, these two instincts war with each other, and at some point one of them wins, and we've experienced that, and we don't rationalize it afterwards as... Aha, my will has triumphed in its freedom over my impulses, and I have chosen to eat. No. We say, like, yeah, I, I wasn't sure, but turned out I was more hungry than I was tired. Or, you know, and, and there are lots of other things, you know, picking between two different foods. Was, it, was I really in the mood for ice cream, or was I in the mood for a donut? Again, it's not, you know, the, the triumph of our Nietzschean uber will. It's... Yeah, I was kind of torn between the two of them, and eventually the ice cream won out. Or eventually the donut won out. That's the way we experience it. So, the problem with this is it is a familiar contradiction, because the explanation for these two apparent contradictories not really being contradictory is something entirely in our experience, and something we entirely recognize as false. So, for example, suppose we were to transport a medieval man into the modern era, and then told him, I have sent a message to somebody miles away, but I didn't write anything down with paper or vellum or, you know, tree bark or what have you. I didn't use any form of ink. I sent no smoke signal. I sent no, you know, no bird of any kind. And he got it within moments of me having sent it. Well, that sounds like a contradiction. Like, you can't do that given what you've just described. You have to be wrong about something here. Except... There simply are properties of the world that this medieval man would not know. He doesn't know about electromagnetic radiation and the ability... Well, he wouldn't know about electricity either, really. And the ability to use that, you know, in computers and so on. So, like, the fact that I sent a text message to somebody else is simply not within the realm of things that are possible in the known world to him. But it's nonetheless possible. And so extending that, there, you know, we know about the, um... What is it? The, uh... Uh, we're at the point of it being the electroweak force. Um, there's the strong electroweak force now. I forget whether those have been unified. But, you know, in gravity. And, you know, so we know about those fields. And then, you know, there are other fields. The Higgs field and so on. People have heard about recently. Gives, you know, some amount of mass to some particles. Um, but, you know, there could be, for all we know, 27 other fields that interact with things according to some property, you know, interact with the stuff we normally deal with, I mean, according to some properties that we don't know. And, you know, so, you know, given that, it could be something like, you know, Heracles could be, you know, a person who also, you know, shared part of the nature of a being a creature that interacted with, you know, 13 of these 27 different fields, and this is why he had this superhuman strength, because, you know, much of the energy came from the interactions of other fields we just don't know about. The same thing about Zeus throwing thunderbolts. There could be such a creature. There could be such a creature that was made a, you know, existed primarily as, you know, um, energy particles, etc. in these other fields that we don't know about that interact in, you know, ways we're just not used to with the stuff we do actually normally interact with. Entirely possible. It, it's not possible to say that these things can't happen. This is the sort of thing normally covered by, like, you can't prove a, a, a negative. Um, or you can't prove non-existence. And, and there are lots of things for which you can. But this sort of thing, you know, there's an entirely different natural phenomenon that we've simply got no experience of. Could be. Um, 
I'm, I'm not saying, you know, therefore one concludes that there is such a thing, simply because it's possible, but rather um, that when presented with claims, you know, like that, like, like you know, Thor and, and Zeus and so on, well, it entirely could be, even from a materialist perspective, it could be. I mean, you know, myself, I, I'm very agnostic about the Greek gods, the Norse gods, and so on. I, I don't... Um, for those who understand the distinction between the uncreated creator of all that is and contingent things within the world, I don't find the, the you know, which um, the pagan gods are, I don't find the contingent things within the world like that to be all that important or interesting. But, you know, for all I know, they existed, or exist. Um, and, you know, they might well exist, you know, as perfectly natural creatures in some sense, with just a nature different than ours, and therefore by being different we would call it supernatural. Um... You know, so, you know, like, like take, um, you know, another example of that sort of thing. You know, take the, the fish that in the water, even though there's no light, they can use electrical impulses because they've got the appropriate sorts of sensors to tell, you know, where things are and their, their basic shape and so on. Is, is that supernatural perception? It sort of is to me. I mean, I can't do it. No human being can do that sort of thing. So they're able to tell things in manner, you know, with a nature different from mine um, and have this ability that I don't have. Or, you know, take the insects and other things that can see into the ultraviolet spectrum or can see into the infrared. Are those, you know, is that supernatural perception? Well, I mean, clearly they are natural creatures in the sense of they, are, they all exist within creation. Um, but, you know, they, they have powers that I don't have. So, you know, are they supernatural? Obviously, you know, materialists will say no because they only disbelieve in the supernatural and the supernatural is everything they don't believe in. Um... But, you know, in, in a broader sense, um, supernatural doesn't have a really good definition. It becomes, you know, very problematic if you ever try to really nail down what you mean. Um, but, you know, applying this a little bit further afield, um, there's some obvious implications to Christianity. But, you know, I'm going to stick off of Christianity, so this isn't, you know, this isn't me defending Christianity. This is just me discussing a concept. Uh, consider the Hindu concept of reincarnation. Uh, now, when I say that, you do have to remember that, that in the East and the West, we draw very different distinctions between the soul and the body. Um, so as I understand it, you know, within the Hindu idea of reincarnation, things like your memories and personality and so on are really part of your body. Um, and and the, the soul, the Atman that is reincarnated, is a lot closer to like a life force um, and not, you know, bring with it the memories and so on. Um, that idea that like your memories and personality and so on would move from one body to another was a, a Western take on hearing this idea. Um, it was kind of popular in things like theosophy, if I recall correctly. Um, but taking the Hindu concept of reincarnation about the life force moving around, well, I'm, I'm, you know, as a ordinary human being, I'm not real clear on why it is that some bits of matter actually do behave like they're living and some don't. And, I mean, on an atomic level, it's really, really hard to tell the difference between a fresh corpse and a person who is alive, but, say, sleeping. Um, I mean, yes, you, you know, there are things like, you know, you can take EEGs of the one, you find brain waves in the, the living person and, you know, not in the fresh corpse. But if you actually look into, like, the, the science around declaring people dead, it's actually surprisingly complicated because our bodies actually die in stages. Um, so, you know, we, we, parts of us will still be alive when our heart is dead and so on, hence, you know, why you have official definitions of whether or not somebody's dead, um, you know, and, and why that stuff is so tricky. So the, the point being, in that sort of very broad sense, um, you know, it, it's exactly, you know, what is it that, like, why is it, that this clump of matter actually keeps on going, and this other matter can't, even though a bunch of it's still going. Um, it's, you know, we know that the one can and the one can't, by and large, although we occasionally mistake dead people for living people and vice versa. But, in any event, um, you know, nonetheless, there are things here that are outside of our normal experience, and so... You know, is reincarnation possible? Is it possible for a, you know, life force in some sense to move? Well, it's outside of my experience, so, I mean, I don't believe that happens, but on the other hand, I can't really say that I know that it doesn't. It's just too far outside of my experience. So, you know, that sort of thing, it's not not in the realm of a contradiction um, that I can know about because it's just you know too much of it depends on things far outside my experience and the unfortunate thing about this 
about being realistic about what we do know to be contradictory and what we don't know to be contradictory is that it leaves us open to a lot of people spouting nonsense and then saying that the, the resolution in the apparent contradiction is just outside of our experience. You know, it's, it's just, it's, we can't comprehend it. And yeah, that's true. We do leave ourselves open to that. Um, life's hard. If you're being honest about it, and it's one reason why a lot of people prefer to not be honest and just decide that they know some things are, are true, some things are definitely false, and um, just have complete certainty about everything. Um, fundamentalists of both the Christian and the atheistic kind are, are exactly like that. I ever have any experience with them. They, they have iron certainty about everything. Um, they're, they're kind of weird, frankly. Um, but in any event, yeah. Like, if we're, if we're going to be honest about, you know, what can we really eliminate and what can't we... Um, and, and there's some people, incidentally, who'll do this sort of halfway, where they'll say, like, well, I can't prove that it's not true, and then they come up with some rationalization for how they're going to assume that it definitely isn't anyhow, that their lack of... That their, you know, lack of knowledge about whether something is true or false is somehow equivalent to the knowledge that it is false. Um... So, uh, you know, that's a little bit of a different thing from, you know, betting. Um, you know, that we bet on things, like, like, in some sense I bet on Poseidon not being particularly related to the ocean. Um, although in a more proper sense I actually uh, bet on, um, on God's dominion over everything and therefore, you know, heavily constricting what, if Poseidon existed, he could do with the high seas. Um, high seas are dangerous places anyway, though. So it's not like you can ever be perfectly safe on the high seas. But anyway, um, so in short, if you're going to be really honest about things, there's a lot of things we have to admit that we simply don't know. And furthermore, one needs to be honest about these things that not only do we not know them, it's not equivalent to, somehow our ignorance is not equivalent to knowledge. We actually do live in ignorance on a lot of points. Um, so... You know, now, the Christian is in a much, much better position than, than the atheist because the world being rationally ordered, there are a lot of things you can know, even though you don't know the intermediates, because you do know a lot about how God would, in fact, order the world. Whereas, if there is no God rationally ordering the world, we live in a rather large amount of ignorance and have absolutely no reason whatever to suppose that the universe is actually comfortable in any way, you know, conformable to our expectations, intelligible in any fashion. And I always love the cheat that, like, well, you know, but if you do, it seems to work out so far. Yeah. Yeah, in some sense, if you basically act as if you're a Christian, the world does seem to work out. Um, funny that. Anyway, until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.